Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. We have the word this morning that uh, anyone in Christ, new creation, the old is gone, the new is here. And so even as we uh, miss the Lent season where we have self reflection, we think about ways we need to remove sin from our life. We never forget where we are headed. We're headed to Easter, the resurrection, to Jesus, giving us that certainty that death and shame and guilt be left behind into the new creation. And so we rise together, sing hymns of praise and thanksgiving. Number 915. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. 
Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Watch me thoroughly from my iniquity. For I know my transgressions. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent is from Isaiah chapter 12. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is your midst in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father while he was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into hell and sits the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We invite the children to come forward now for the children's message. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. We've got some more on their way up. Hello, good morning. We're doing children's sermons again. How are you all today? So one of the commandments we did in our morning opening this morning was the ninth commandment. Do you remember what it is? We should not, Nate? Covet our neighbor's house. Covet our neighbor's house. So the ninth and tenth commandments are about coveting. Now what? So if I those really cool shoes, 
and I say, my shoes don't light up and sparkle. I wish I could have those shoes. What's wrong with that? Is this is that coveting? What do you think? Yeah. You think it's coveting? No. If I just say, those are my shoes, I'm glad you've got those shoes. Is that coveting? Yeah. So what's the difference? What's the difference? Hmm? Want, want them. So I want, and I don't appreciate what I have, I mean, my shoes aren't bad, are they? And, and what if a pastor, instead of wearing black shoes at the altar, was wearing light up sparkly shoes? You think it might distract you? So should I be glad that I've got comfortable shoes that I can stand at the altar, instead of be lighting up on the, on the altar and distracting people? Yeah, I should be glad, because that's a privilege to get to stand up here and be a part of God's gifts going out, right? So I should be glad that you've got your pretty awesome shoes. And I should be glad that my shoes are part of the work that I get to do. And they work for me, right? So if I'm glad with what I have, and glad that you've got what you've got, and you've got what you've got, and you've got what you've got, and we give thanks for the good gifts, then it's trusting that God gives us what we need Trusting that God loves each of us to give us different gifts at different times. And part of what we see in our reading, it was a long reading this morning, is just how, how bad covetousness can become. Because the older son is covetous of the fattened calf being given to his brother, right? He was angry. His brother had already been given a lot, and he had wasted it. And now when he comes home, he gets the fattened calf, and he says... You've never given me a young goat to celebrate with my friends, right? So that's being coveting, right? What does the father say to him? He said, you've always been with me, and all that is mine that's yours. See, what coveting often does for us is it keeps us from seeing what we already have. It keeps us from appreciating what God's giving to us. So we should be glad if we're playing a game and we lose and somebody else wins, can you be glad that the other person won? Be glad for them? That's being a good, a good loser, right? Right? And if we see people are given different gifts, and we think, oh, Michael got the gift I wanted, I could be glad that Michael got the gift and Michael's going to get to appreciate it and wait and see what I'm going to get. I'm going to read that line to you again. Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Think about all he had. But by coveting, he lost track of it. He didn't see it. So when the Bible tells us not to covet, we know that God's going to take care of us, that we should look for the blessings that God's giving us and be glad for the blessings that other people have. Make sense? All right, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we give thanks. We get to pray and call you Father, that you've revealed to us your love. And we know that you give good things to other people, but you give us good things too. We pray that when you give good things to others, we'll be able to celebrate with them, and that we'll always be watching to see what good things you're giving to us, even if they're things we're not expecting, or even things that we didn't even want in the first place. We trust that you will take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've got children's bulletins, and we will sing our next hymn.
should have a lasting life receive. Christ Jesus is the ground of faith, who was made flesh and suffered death. All then who trust in and mercy to you from our creator, our dear father revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our text is from the epistle. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, Jesus' parable of the two lost sons is a perfect picture of everything that we read in the epistle. It's a picture of seeing the new creation by faith. When the younger son arrives home, the father could have seen things differently. He could have seen the filth covering a son who had gone into such a dark place. He could have felt the rejection that the son's earlier departure meant. He could have recognized the desperation of a man who had nowhere else to go. Instead, the father had compassion. He did not regard his lost son according to the flesh. In fact, he directly says, his son is a new creation. My son was dead, and he is now alive. So what does it look like to regard somebody not according to the flesh, but as a new creation? It looks like Luke 15. It looks like the father in this parable. And not just the father with his younger son, When the party begins and the older son refuses to come in, refuses to celebrate, again, the father offers grace. He goes outside to plead with his older son, his second lost son. Now, Jesus doesn't tell us at the end of the parable how the second son reacts. We don't know if he comes in, if he runs away, if he becomes a full-on prodigal himself. It's all left open because... How we respond to grace is open. Each day we make a decision about how we respond to grace. 
And Jesus was giving grace to the tax collectors and the sinners and the scribes and the Pharisees thought, well, this is unfair that he spends so much time with them when they have made a wreck of their lives. Look what we've made of our lives. See, they were looking at things according to the flesh. They were looking at their works and they thought all they had done had earned them a higher spot at God's table. This is viewing people according to the flesh. What you've done, they say, that defines you. Well, Jesus insists that the creator defined you in the first place, and he has the last word as well. And that's the message of the gospel. The creator has become one of us to redeem us and redefine us in grace. So the father in Jesus' parable has grace not just on the younger son, whose sins are forgiven, but he has grace on the older son, whose pride is being forgiven. And Paul says we regard no one according to the flesh. That's our chance to see people not according to what they've done, but according to that declaration in Christ that their sins are forgiven, that all things will be made new. It means we're called to act like that father in Luke 15. Of course, we know that the father is a picture of our heavenly father. We'll never be that gracious. But if we're his children, we're called to walk in his steps. Now, that father didn't have an easy time of it. Remember how much in that world and in that age, honor and shame really defined who you were, really set your place in the world. And so what had happened to the father was shameful. The prodigal son doesn't just leave and nobody talks about it. The prodigal son leaves in such a public way that people talk a lot about it. What happened that this man had his son wish that he was dead, take his inheritance? Remember, they don't have bank accounts either. This is not just a matter of going to the bank and saying, I'll take half. This is the younger son selling all of that property in order to leave and be mobile and go away. Now, the older son could have stepped in and stopped this. So this is not how we're going to treat our father. But instead, if you follow the details of the parable, the older son knows more, or at least thinks he knows more, about what the younger son has been doing than Jesus ever said the younger son was doing. It just says he wasted his property. But the older son later steps in with the details of what he spent it on. Here's the itemized list that we've been gossiping about. So this shame is ongoing for the father. The fact that he's willing to treat his sons with grace costs something. So the father could have said no when his younger son asked for inheritance. He would say, I'd like for you to be dead. Give me my inheritance now. The first response is no. That's not going to happen. Well, he could have disciplined the boy. He could have threatened, if you're going to treat me that way, you won't get any of the inheritance. I've got another son. He's pretty good. Have you not noticed? The shame could have been hidden. It could have been placed all on the brat. But the father, by allowing him to go that way, takes some of the shame on himself, takes the entirety of the shame on himself. See, it's important we recognize that if you're going to follow that father in walking in grace, there is a cost. When we treat people graciously, it's not free money. Let's be clear. When Paul says we regard no one according to the flesh, Paul has no illusions. He doesn't think, hey, because I believe in God, suddenly the new creation means all the people around me are no longer sinners. The same Paul wrote to the Romans, I am of the flesh. Sold under sin. I am of the flesh, sold under sin. When the apostle himself says, I am the flesh, he regards himself that way. He knows what it means. That he's going to keep sinning. I'm going to do the very thing I do not want to do. So even if we regard no one according to the flesh, until we get to the resurrection, when these truths are sealed in new creation, we remain sinners, every last one of us. If I regard my neighbor not according to the flesh, I am graciously overlooking something that is still true about him. He is both saint and sinner. Or, in some of these cases, just plain sinner. But I am looking past that to the offering that Christ made to pay for those sins. And when I don't regard someone according to the flesh, who is still partly according to the flesh, sold under sin, 
the cost in that graciousness will be shame and betrayal and being hurt by people who don't treat you the same way. It happens. Now let's take this to a really hard place. Many parents, they know exactly what I'm about to describe because they've had prodigal sons return home to them. And these prodigal sons in our day and age, they come home just as desperate as that younger son. They've spent whatever money they had, and we know what they've spent it on, the drugs that they're addicted to. And so to get more money, to be able to buy more drugs, they've stolen, they've lied, they put on those guilt trips, whatever it took while their bodies suffered under the slavery of addiction, they do it. And they come back one more time. They come back and the sad prodigal says, I'm sorry, I'm changed. This time will be different. I'll never do it again. I finally given it all up. And when he says those things, part of him means it. He may even believe it, right? This time I'm gonna be different. But I tell you, those parents don't believe it anymore. It's not a lack of love that's brought them to that point of not believing those words. It's bitter experience. They've loved and labored and prayed and paid. But like so many others, they've learned the unforgiving math, the staggeringly high relapse percentage in our world today. Which is why it's worth stopping for a moment to say to all of those, especially those who are younger, don't start. Don't ever get into this. Don't try it and experiment. Just say no was right. Never try. If something ever happened to make you say, I'm going to experiment once, stop right there and get help. And don't wait until you're deeper down this path. Brothers and sisters, I have seen too many good lives wrecked, too many good lives cut short by these addictions. Do not submit to this slavery. And having said that, we come back to these parents who did make the choices to say no all those times, but have their own lives now caught up in loving somebody who is entangled in this and cannot get them free. What do you say to that prodigal who comes home and says, this time, give me one more chance. This time it will be different. What does it mean in this situation to regard no one according to the flesh? Do you have to believe every last time? Sure, this time will be different. Do you have to ever and ever until that eventual overdose say, I forgive, I give more money. I'm going to keep buying that you really do repent. They don't even have a choice there. They can't keep believing. They know what the flesh is. Regarding people not according to the flesh is not a denial of reality. Paul explained that reality. I am of the flesh, sold under sin. To truly believe in the new creation includes the clear-eyed, sober view that being of the flesh is being sold to sin, but that that's not all we are even the ones who are most obviously sold under sin. But we are all sold under sin. We don't overcome addictions by enabling or ignoring reality. The father in Luke 15, he knew his son was filthy. He knew his son was desperate. He knew his son was ritually unclean, having been out amongst the Gentiles, and a proper Jew would not touch that son because that makes him unclean. But knowing all that, he still wrapped his arms around him. And that is what we are talking about. Believing that those facts are the facts. That being of the flesh means being sold to sin. But there's another set of facts that we can believe in Christ that will transcend these on the last day. Regarding a prodigal not according to the flesh, means seeing that that man will be resurrected. And when he's resurrected, despite all he has done to the flesh and despite all the flesh has done to him, 
the resurrection will break all of those chains. And he will be as God intended him to be. The addiction will not last past the grave. It will be broken. And the child that you keep loving and hoping to really be brought free will finally be brought free in the resurrection. And so never losing sight of that person doesn't mean that you're going to say, oh, hey, we'll just give you whatever you want. We're not going to fight this with you. It means I'm still going to forgive the hurt that you're doing to my heart. I'm not going to cauterize and become numb or write you off and say never again. I'm not going to be hurt again. You can still throw your arms around the son who has broken your heart a dozen times, even knowing the math and the odds that you're not at the end yet. That there'll be a dozen plus one and plus two. Refusing to regard according to the flesh does not mean setting aside our responsibilities we have as families. Families are called to protect one another. And the steps that we take in trying to fight addiction, they regard addiction for what it is. It's like an infection that afflicts the body with fever and running noses and fatigue. So addiction afflicts the flesh with deception, dissolution, and relapse. So to fight addiction, families need wise counsel. They need to take steps that are hard, that are going to be called by the addicted one unloving. But that doesn't mean they are unloving. To protect people and take those hard steps is loving. Don't take up these battles alone, brothers and sisters. There's support in your church family. There's support out there to help you. And even if you don't fight the battle perfectly, your sins are forgiven. Don't regard yourself according to the flesh. You are forgiven, and the Father is still watching out for each one of these that we don't know what to do with. He loves them and has a plan for them. And resurrection is part of that plan. And also never lose the eternal hope that we have in Christ. No matter how many times the flesh rises up to return back to the pigs, we trust there will be a final and lasting resurrection in which God makes good that imperfect confession. The one that says this time it will be different. God is the one who will say this time it is different on the last day. See, in all this, we have more than just a parable to see what we mean by not regarding people according to the flesh. We have the example of Jesus himself. He knew how Jerusalem would treat him. He knew what Jerusalem was according to the flesh. He told us again and again, when I go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I will rise again. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross, suffering the shame. Knowing what would happen in the new creation. He threw his arms around Jerusalem, knowing he would be stabbed in the back. But he went forward to the cross because he could see his brothers and sisters redeemed and brought through to the new creation. Grace had a cost. It has a cost. And he paid in shame and in suffering. He paid on the cross. For our sake the Lord made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that was the price. We have God as Father because of that moment when the Father looked at his beloved Son not according to his holy flesh. See, in Jesus' case, his flesh had never sinned. He said no every last time to the tempter. And he took that perfect, spotless flesh to the cross. That flesh had returned the, retained the purity of the old creation through to the very end. But rather than see what he had done by his works, Jesus asked to be seen according to our sin. He took on our sin that we might be the righteousness of God. That was his price. And what an exchange. What an exchange. He suffered that alienation from the Father that never ought to have been in the perfect love of the Trinity. He suffered that alienation that we might draw near to God forevermore. And that great exchange was made not just for a handful, not just for the apostles or Jesus' favorites, 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is what we believe. That he paid for the sins of the world. And so whomever I come across in life, however many times they have disappointed me and hurt me, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, seven times, 70 times. We look past the flesh. We see the new creation. We see Jesus made all in all. We see the reward of grace so much greater than what it costs here in this life. So all praise to Christ, our forgiving Lord, to the Father on high, and the Spirit who brings us into new creation now and forevermore. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Give us a proper knowledge of the evil we have done in your sight. Move us to confess our sins and offenses against you and justify us by your holy absolution. Set us free in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father in heaven, you welcome us into your family for the sake of your son. Call us to repentance when we wander from your ways or believe we have earned a place in your household by our works. Return us to the confident joy that in Christ alone we are found and are alive. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have made your deeds known among us. Bless pastors, teachers, musicians, and all church workers in their daily labors to make known your deeds among the peoples. We pray for our sister congregation, Resurrection, and their pastor, John Halleck. 
Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, we are brought forth in iniquity and conceived in sin. Make us ever grateful that in holy baptism you forgive and enliven even the smallest child. And that for Jesus' sake you wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, in Christ Jesus, you are reconciling the world to yourself. Watch over our nation and all whom you have placed in authority. Give them wisdom and prudence that your people might live in peace and freely make known the message of reconciliation. We pray for our families and parents who struggle to know, to seek that wisdom to raise their children. We ask that you'd give them strength and endurance. Give them that wisdom indeed. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for all who cry out for mercy, healing, and help. Those who have asked for prayers, Becky, Tammy, Janice, Tony, Marianne, Barb, Emily, Fred, Mark, Rick, Betty, Joni, Lisa, Kathy, Marguerite, Jim, Joyce, Betty, Laura, Debbie, Stephen, Stephen, Dwayne, Doris, Rich, Eddie, Luella, Rhonda, Nikki, Wade, Kent, Dottie, Dee, Jack, Brad, Adeline, Paula, Becky, Charles, Raymond, Roger, Debbie, Sarita, Vanessa, Sean, Stephanie, Serene, Henry, Douglas, Brandon, Rita, Rodney, Betty, Kayla, Jason, Don, Vicki, Joe, Robin, Will, Sarah, Todd, Charlotte, Charlie, Christy, Deborah, Stella, Ruth, Tammy, Suzanne, Stacy, Lisa, Dave, Rowan, Kathleen, Jim, Don, Donna, Kyle, Rod, Teresa, Alicia, Betty, and David. Deliver them according to your will, and as you have made them a new creation in Christ, Keep them mindful of the day when sorrow and sickness will be no more. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, fill the hearts of your people in their various callings with the joy of your salvation, that they may make it known in all the earth, wherever they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, giver and perfecter of our faith, we thank and praise you for continuing among us the preaching of your gospel for our instruction and edification. Send your blessing upon the word which has been spoken to us, and by your Holy Spirit increase our saving knowledge of you, that day by day we may be strengthened in the divine truth and remain steadfast in your grace. Give us strength to fight the good fight and by faith to overcome all the temptations of Satan, the flesh, and the world, so that we may finally receive the salvation of our souls. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And bless you. Bless we the Lord. Thank you, God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the Ask the congregation to be seated as we have a few announcements. As we head towards Holy Week, it's a time where we uh, step up uh, the prayers that we do for one another in this congregation for our community. And so I ask that uh, each of you would take a look at our prayer list. Um, take a look at the names that are on there. And if you've got an update on any of the people who've been on our prayer list, uh, get those in. Some of the people on there, uh, maybe it's time that we've been praying for something and they've received it. And now we want to move to giving thanks for those prayers. So we want to get the prayer list updated as we head towards Holy Week. Uh, and if there's somebody new that we need to get on the prayer chain, let us know. Uh, so give some thought to updating this prayer chain before we are in Holy Week, if you can. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Don. No, it's just one. Well, we have in the past, we've done uh, up to a 2,000 eggs. Uh, I don't know if we need to go all that way. I think in the, we, we did 2,000 was our high water mark, and then we maybe we stepped it back to. So we, we do a lot of eggs because it goes fast. So we're, we're going to need help. Not real gold, right?
So that's on Easter? Or at the Easter egg hunt? So, participate in this part too. So, so there, this is new. We're going to have decorate your own Easter egg and bring it in, and you get a prize. Yeah. Bring back the Easter bonnets and the, the decorated Easter eggs. This is going to be fun. Thank you, Don. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, day nine will start April 6th. And then we have two decorated days. The ninth, and then we'll have two. Okay. Bye. And decorated just for kids. No, you can not. Ah. Yes. So bring candy in, and there are opportunities for stuffing the candy. Yeah, there's a there's a, a bucket up there that you can bring and leave candy through the week. Um, we'll probably uh, move that to you know it'll get the trunk will get emptied and we'll. Keep. Yeah. Uh, all right, any other announcements people want to bring to our attention? So we have book club today at the church, and everybody's uh, welcome to stay. We're going to be reading about the faithful spy, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, during the World War II. Uh, was a Lutheran pastor who decided he, he needed to work as a spy to try and uh, bring down uh, Nazis. And uh, he ended up uh, di dying in a concentration camp after he'd been discovered and arrested and put in a concentration camp. So this tells his story, how he made the decisions he did and what actions he took. It's a, a fascinating book, and we'll have a chance to talk about it. Even if you didn't get a chance to read the book, come and join us. We've got lunch. Uh, I'm happy to have fellowship over the meal discussing the book. Uh, other announcements people want to bring to our attention? We continue our Wednesday night services uh, this Wednesday, both 5 and 7, with a meal in between. We have our daily devotions on the website and on the credenza back there. God's blessings on your week.